Go ahead and take your seats. And you know, over the last few weeks, we've been speaking about the vision and the mission of our church. We had um, Mission Sunday, Global Mission Sunday, probably about, a, I don't know, a month ago. I heard from Pastor Phil Dooley, and then we had Local Mission Sunday, where we talked about the, the local at working of that. And, you know, our vision is to be a healthy church, changing lives through Christ. I love it because it's easy to remember. I would encourage you to memorize it and to dwell on it and to really meditate on what that means. But, you know, as we heard on um, Mission Sunday, our focus this year isn't necessarily what we are doing, although we obviously do things and it matters, but our our concern is more with who we are becoming, right? And on Global Mission Sunday, Pastor Phil gave us what I believe was a prophetic statement for our church and about who we are as a church. And he said this. He said, we are a people with deep conviction, united in community, and fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so two weeks ago, we started this series, and Damien preached about being a people of deep conviction, and then talked about the next week, last week, how we are a unified community. And I'm going to close this, this series today. Um, and my message is titled, A People Fueled by the Spirit. Amen? Yeah. So when I was 14 years old, um, I was born in Ontario moved around a bunch to different places, and then ended up back here when I was 14. And I grew up in church, um, but when I was at the age of 14, I moved back to Ontario and ended up attending a Pentecostal church. And it was the first time I'd attended a Pentecostal church. I'd been part of a Baptist church, I'd been part of an Alliance church, I'd been part of a Mennonite Brethren church out west, and all wonderful church communities, but I suddenly found myself in a Pentecostal church, and it was the first time that I started to hear about the gifts of the Spirit, and the first time that I experienced speaking in tongues. I had this amazing encounter at a youth camp, and God gave me the gift of tongues, and, and so I found myself in this kind of unfamiliar world, but I'm so grateful for it because, honestly, it just shaped so much of my, of my faith and it was so formative for my future. But I'm very aware, as we're talking about the Holy Spirit today, that we have a very diverse church in a lot of different ways. Um, and honestly, we celebrate those differences. I love them. Damien talked last week about how, you know, the gospel unifies people, and it truly does. But the fact that we have a diverse church means that I am aware that as we're talking about the Holy Spirit today, there might be some of you that are from church backgrounds where this is not a familiar, familiar territory to you, and maybe you're a little bit nervous at the moment. Maybe you're like, oh, this is going to be uncomfortable. And I just want to say it's okay. I actually understand you know, there's a lot of, there, there's, there's been people in the Big C Church that at times have, have maybe made the Holy Spirit seem really weird. And it actually isn't the Holy Spirit's fault, it's humanity, right? And so, and then sometimes we think the Holy Spirit is weird because we don't understand necessarily all of the ways that he works. Sometimes he can move in ways that are like, don't make sense. And we need to understand that just because we don't understand all of the ways that he moves, it doesn't make it wrong, right? I mean, the Bible is full of stories of God moving in ways that defy logic, that defy understanding, right? And so truthfully, if everything God, made, everything God did made sense, we wouldn't need faith, right? Um, so if our mission, being a healthy church, changing lives through Christ, that's our mission, it actually cannot be accomplished without the work of the Spirit. It cannot be accomplished without the Holy Spirit. And so although we may not all have the same experiences in our upbringings, here's what I know. 
We all need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more of him in our lives. We need more of him in our marriages. We need more of him in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools. We need him more in our church. We need the Holy Spirit. If we are going to accomplish everything that God has called us to be and to do, it requires a work of the Spirit. Amen? And so I want to start um, with number one, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So I think it's important that we start with the promise. And I don't know about you, but have you ever had somebody promise you something and then not deliver on that promise? I think probably most of us in this room could put up our hand and think of something. And I was thinking about it this week, and the first thing that came to mind was this story. And Damien was like, are you over that? Because that was a long time ago. I was like, no, I was over it, but it was the first thing that came to my mind. But I remember a time early on in our church, um, we planted a church almost 15 years ago, and we had moved here from Australia, a church that we love dearly and we're very involved in. And, and so a couple years in, we were, we were starting to kind of really miss Australia. And it was around, you know, maybe a few months before what would have been Hillsong Conference. It was Hillsong Conference was every single July. And so Hillsong Conference was such a massive part of our lives for a decade. And so we were just like, oh, I really wish we could have gone. But we were like broke church planters. Like broke, broke, broke church planters. And so going was not, was not an option. And I remember, we remember sitting with this pastor and we were just sharing with him. He's asking us how we're doing. We're just sharing with him about how much we missed Australia. And he was like, oh, I would really love to fly you guys to Australia for Hillsong Conference. And we were like, what? This is awesome. God, you're so good. You, you know, you answer our prayers. Da, da, da. Anyways, had this meeting. He went off, never to hear from him again. He totally just like ghosted us. And we never heard from him again. A broken promise. You guys know what that feels like, right? Well, in Acts 1, 3 to 8, Jesus made a promise to his disciples. He had died, risen again, and was readying himself to ascend to heaven. And this is what it says. Acts, 3, Acts 1, 3 to 8. It says, after his suffering... Jesus presented himself to them, the disciples, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and, and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father pro promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Just one chapter later in Acts 2 as the disciples did what Jesus told them to do, which was not to leave Jerusalem and to just wait. They gathered in the upper room to pray and worship, and Scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit came. And it tells us that it, he came like a rushing wind, that tongues of fire rested upon them, and that he enabled them to speak in other tongues and to bear witness to the gospel to thousands of people about Jesus, which thereby fulfilled the promise that Jesus had given them just a few days before. And of course, he fulfilled his promise. Of course, he fulfilled his promise. That's what God does. His whole life, Jesus' life, was a fulfillment of God's promise to reconcile humanity to himself. I am very grateful that God keeps his promises. Because we know people break promises. But God never does. 
He never has, and he never will. And Jesus was faithful to his promise when he said that the Holy Spirit would come. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's important to remember that although he came in a new way in the book of Acts, he was always present. He wasn't new on the scene. Throughout scripture, from Old Testament to new, the Holy Spirit has been at work. Our God is a triune God. It's kind of a hard concept to wrap our heads around, but if you're new in the faith, it's the fact that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. One God, three persons, all distinct, but unified, cannot be separated. Doesn't make sense, right, to us, but it's amazing. But the Holy Spirit was present, Scripture tells us, he was present at creation, and he was present all throughout the Old Testament. But there's various prepositions that the Bible uses in regards to the Holy Spirit, which helps to bring understanding, I guess, to the difference between the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the coming of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised in the New Testament. And a lot of time in the Old Testament, it talks about the Holy Spirit coming upon people or being with people or even being in people for a special task, for a specific purpose, like it was for people like Moses, Joshua, David, even Samson and the prophets, God filled them to accomplish something, right? And in 1 Samuel 10, when when King Saul was anointed as king, it says the Holy Spirit came upon him. But then later on in 1 Samuel 16, because of his pride and his rebellious heart, it actually says that the Holy Spirit departed from him. And later, King David was the next to be anointed as king, and and he sinned. And later on, we see David pray this prayer after being confronted by Nathan the prophet. And David said in Psalm 51, 10, 11, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And I just think of David having sinned, having fallen short, having disobeyed the Lord, thinking of Saul, thinking of his predecessor who had been anointed, who had had the Holy Spirit, and yet the Holy Spirit had been taken. And in David's humility, he repented and he came before God and said, do not take your spirit from me. And of course, God was faithful and stayed with him. So there was an anointing on specific people for specific purpose. There was a promise that one day the Spirit of the Lord would come to dwell on all people. All of God's people. Not just specific people for a specific task. And not just the Jewish people. But all of God's people. The prophet Joel prophesied about it in Joel 2, 28 and 29. And he said this, I will... Pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women. Praise the Lord for that. Where are the women at? Both men and women. I will pour out my spirit in those days. So this prophecy given hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene actually began to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in that upper room when the Holy Spirit came to dwell with God's people. First to the Jews, then to the Gentiles as the gospel started to be spread across the earth. And so now that we understand the promise of the Holy Spirit, let's number two look at the purpose of the Holy Spirit. In the book of John, as Jesus sat with his disciples after the Last Supper and before 
he was arrested before he went to the cross, Jesus taught them about the Holy Spirit that was going to come. It says in John 14, 15 to 17, this is Jesus speaking, and he said, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. So there's another example of the propositions. The Holy Spirit was with them, but he was now going to be in them. John 14, 26 to 27, Jesus continues. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. In John 15, 26 and 27, he says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So from these passages, Jesus is making it clear what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. There are several, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk about two. So firstly, the Holy Spirit is a helper a companion, an advocate. The word that, that is used in the Greek is paraclete. And it literally means companion, advocate, one who comes alongside. And you know, when Jesus, of course, we know that he walked the earth, he walked alongside his disciples. He taught them, he guided them, he modeled a godly life. He counseled them. He showed them what the kingdom of heaven was like. He was their friend, their leader, their companion for three years. But then Jesus ascended to heaven and was no longer there to instruct them and show them the ways of God. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. That word, that, that, the word in Greek there, another advocate, comes from the word alos, and it means another of the same kind. So the Holy Spirit was another of the same kind, meaning everything that Jesus was to the disciples, the Holy Spirit would become for them. And Jesus actually said, it is better for you that I go so that you can receive the Spirit. Amen? And so what does that mean for us? It means the same thing it meant for the disciples. The Holy Spirit is our advocate, our counsel, our helper. He's been given to us as a gift to help guide us through life. You know, in January 2023, my daughter, we have three daughters. My eldest daughter is uh, studying in Australia at the moment. And so she went at the beginning of Jan January 2023. I took her to Australia to help get her settled. And we were gone for two weeks. And at the end of that two weeks, I was going to come home by myself. So it was a little bit overwhelming. But it was a busy couple of weeks. I was driving around, picking up furniture, getting her settled in her house, getting her registered for college, you know, doing all the things. And um, there was this particular day that my daughter is amazing. I love her so much. We are actually very close. But she is strong-willed. I don't know where she gets it from. Perhaps her mother. But um, we were just having one of those days where, like, everything didn't go to plan. And so we were just kind of nagging at each other, as moms and daughters can do sometimes, and having a bit of a stressful morning. And I had to take her to a job interview. She had applied for a job, and she had a job interview. And so I drove, I was at a golf course, and so I drove into the golf course, parked the car, and I was like, all right, Jalen, and I started giving her this pep talk. I was like, all right, look, you need a job. Um, this job is available, it's great. So you need to like put on a smile, 
just forget about the fact that the morning has been a little crazy and go in there and get the job and it's going to be awesome, you know? And so she's like, yeah, yeah, okay. So she, she leaves. And as I'm sitting there by myself, I'm like just so overwhelmed. And I'm like thinking of all the things that I had to do and thinking about the fact that like I am leaving my daughter in Australia. What the heck? And just had become really overwhelmed in that moment. And I remember just like closing my eyes and going, Holy Spirit, I need you. I cannot do this. Like, I don't know how to release my daughter. <laughs> I need your help. And it was like in that moment, it was like, it wasn't an audible voice, but it certainly felt like it. And I heard the Spirit of God say, Julie, Jalen's going to learn things here that she cannot learn in your home, under your care. And I've got her. And she is exactly where she needs to be. And do you know what? It was literally all I needed. From that moment, I felt peace. And I just felt this release, like, okay, I can do this. I'm going to leave her, and I'm going to be okay. And she's going to be okay. That is the advocate. That is the Holy Spirit who gives us exactly what we need. And if I didn't invite him into that moment, I would have stayed frustrated, anxious, yet he knew exactly what I needed. And because I invited him in, he answered in a second. And I love the gathering of the church. Like, Sunday is my favorite day of the week. I love the gathering of the church. God loves the gathering of the church. He instructs us not to forsake it because he knows how valuable it is. And there's something powerful that happens when we gather to worship and to pray and to, to sit under the word and to, to fellowship together. But do you understand that here on a Sunday, it's not the only time that you can encounter the Holy Spirit? That moment in Australia, there was no band, no music, there was no pastor, there were no people, there was no goosebumps from that bass that's pumping, there was no fantastic atmosphere and emotion and and I'm not downplaying any of those things because God uses them but I was sitting in my rental car in a golf course parking lot and the Holy Spirit came he came I called out to him in a moment of need and he met me and he filled me and he brought me peace and he was my advocate and he gave me a word that I still rely on. And in those days when I wake up and I'm like, man, I just really miss my girl. <laughs> he reminds me of that word. She is exactly where she needs to be. And I've got her. I'm so grateful for the Holy Spirit. And that is why we need to be filled with his spirit every single day to be hungry for his presence, to be passionate about his presence. The advocate gives us everything that we need in his presence. So the Holy Spirit is our advocate. Secondly, the Holy Spirit reveals truth. If we go back to John 14, 26 to 27, it says this. It says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. In verse 17 of that same chapter, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. What is truth? Isn't that the age-old question? The world would have us believe that we can all have our own truth. But there has to be a source of truth. Because if my truth contradicts with your truth, Whose truth is correct? There's a source of truth. And this is what it is. The Bible, the word of God. Jesus prayed 
in John 17 for all believers right before he was arrested. And in verse 15, he prayed this to the Father. And this prayer was about, uh, was about, was about us, the church. And he said this, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The word of God is truth, which means the Holy Spirit will only lead us back to truth. He will lead us back to the source of truth, and, and he will affirm the word of God. He will convict us where our lives are not aligned to the word of God, and he will empower us to live a life that is aligned with the word of God. None of that is possible in our own strength. But we have to be very careful, church, that we don't use the Holy Spirit to justify choices or behaviors or attitudes that don't align with, the, with God's word. There's people that are very good at spiritualizing things that have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. They have nothing to do with God, and yet we can say, well, God said, somehow makes it palatable. I remember years ago hearing a story of a Christian man who was unfaithful to his wife and decided to pursue a divorce, and his pastor confronted him and was like, well, what are you doing? And the man said, oh, well, the Holy Spirit led me to Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ. He strengthens me. <laughs> and it's crazy, right? Like, it's, it's, it's an example of, like, that is not what that scripture means. I mean, you could literally use that to justify anything. But I, and I think the problem is we can roll our eyes and we can, like, you know, laugh, have a laugh at that guy, but we are all capable of going off track. Like every single one of us is capable of going off track because our self-life and our spirit life are at odds with each other. They're in opposition to each other. There's a, there's a scripture in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, and it says this. It says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. That's just the reality. We have this war going on within us. Spirit, flesh, spirit, flesh. We have to be careful. And so we all need to be filled with the spirit so that we're living with right belief and standing on truth rather than the constantly changing cultural standards. And the beautiful part about the Holy Spirit is that he doesn't bring condemnation. He never brings shame. He never heaps judgment. When it says in John 16, 13 that he guides us into all truth, it's this picture of a shepherd who just lovingly guides us back. He guides us off of a dangerous path, and he brings us back to safety. He guides us, leads us, convicts us, all to protect us and to lead us back to the truth of the word of God. And so I wonder, do you find yourself feeling defeated in your walk with God? Or maybe becoming pessimistic? Do you feel like you have no joy? Do you feel like you're constantly going around the same mountains of defeat? You need the truth of the Holy Spirit operating in your life. You need his wisdom to help lead and guide you. You need his guidance to protect you, to bring you back into the safety of Jesus. In Luke 11:11, 11, 11, it says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
Be hungry for a daily infilling of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says, ask and you will receive. You know, we can complicate things. We can, we can, we can convince ourselves that it's hard. But God just says, ask and you will receive. So we've talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That word power is the Greek word dynamis. And it's, the wor- it's, the, it's where the word dynamic comes from. In the Amplified Version, it says, You shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might. Power, ability, efficiency, and might. The coming of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was about the Holy Spirit coming upon so that believers could be filled with, so that we could then live from the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit would now dwell within his people and empower them to live a faith life. And so I've got a bottle of water. And if you picture this, the bottle being your life, the water being the Spirit, upon salvation, your life is filled with the Spirit. You're given a deposit of the Spirit. We know that because salvation is a work of the Spirit. Scripture tells us nobody can be saved without the work of the Spirit. So the work of the Spirit is involved in salvation. And a lot of Christians stop here. They go, okay, I've received salvation. I've got faith. I'm good. But they don't access the power, the ability, the efficiency, and the might of the Holy Spirit. It's like God is giving us a gift. He's holding it out. And we go, nah, I'm good. I don't need it. But when we ask to be filled, when we receive power, Not only do we receive power, but it overflows so that we can become bold witnesses for Jesus. So so the Holy Spirit, like the the bottle already looks full, but the Holy Spirit will will just pour. He'll pour out, pour out anointing, pour out his presence. So much so that it's overflowing. And so there's, there's, there's water flowing into the bottle. So you are being filled, and at the same time, simultaneously, there's also water flowing out because it's overflowing, which is for the world, which is your witness, which is your example. That is the point of the filling of the Holy Spirit. He said, you will be filled with power, so go. Jerusalem, Samaria, the ends of the earth go. And the more it is filled, the more it overflows. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the overflow, the dynamic ability, efficiency, and might, it fills us and then overflows into those around us. It is God's will for you today to be filled with his Spirit. It is God's will for you to be filled with his spirit every single day. Regardless of your background, regardless of your denomination, or how long you've been a Christian, the Holy Spirit wants to fill you. He wants to empower you for life. He wants you to live with an overcoming spirit, not defeated, and not tossed around by by the waves, but with faith that stands strong. And he wants your life to draw others to him. How do we become people who are 
fueled by the Holy Spirit? How do we become a healthy church, changing lives through Christ? By being people who love the Lord deeply and are passionate about his presence. Some of you here today need a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. Perhaps life's just gotten really busy. You kind of put it on the back burner. And you're here and you're like, I need to be filled today. Perhaps your heart's gotten hard, a little cynical. You've convinced yourself maybe that church is all about you when it's actually all about Jesus. Or perhaps you're new to faith and you're like, I don't really know what you're talking about, but it sounds awesome. I want that. I believe today you're going to receive him. You're going to be filled with his spirit. You know, earlier we had prayer requests for all sorts of things. People that are praying for strength to overcome addictions. Be filled with the spirit. Marriages that are struggling. Be filled with the spirit. So people that are battling anxiety, depression, mental health issues, be filled with the Spirit. It's not like it's going to automatically change your situation, but it is going to empower you. It is going to give you wisdom. It is going to give you peace. It is going to give you guidance. Be filled with the Spirit. And here's the thing, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And that's cliche, I know. But what that means is that he does not seek to control. He does not manipulate. And he will not force himself on you. He waits to be invited in. And in James 4, 8, it says, If you will draw near to God, he will draw near to you. If you draw near, I will draw near, God says. And so today, I'm actually going to ask you. You can stand to your feet. And I'm actually going to ask you, if you want to be filled, I want you to make a move. It's going to require bravery. It's going to require dying to yourself and not caring about your neighbor. But I believe that if you take a step of faith and you come up to the front, and there's nothing special about the front. It's not more anointed up here. But there's something that God does when you make a move. And so if you want to be filled, I believe that you will be filled. If you come and ask and seek, come. Come and be filled. And I'm not going to determine what that looks like. Maybe you will come and you will receive the gift of tongues for the first time. That's awesome. But maybe you'll come and he will just pour a peace out on you. Maybe he will come and you've been struggling with something and God is going to give you supernatural power to overcome something that you have been struggling with. The Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants to do. And he knows exactly what it is that you need. But scripture tells us to eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And so I think also come and ask and receive and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit because they are good and they are for our, our benefit in Jesus' name. So the team's just going to lead us for a few moments. We have some people that are here that are going to pray over you. You can still come. Team will move. We'll find room. But we're going to pray and worship. Come on, team. Thanks.
Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. I pray right now, Lord, that you would fill us. Lord, we are desperate for a touch from you. We are to, desperate, Lord, for your presence to fill us again. I thank you that you are the perfect advocate. You know exactly what it is that we need. Would you fill us to overflowing? Would you give us gifts of the Spirit? Would you pour those out upon people in our church? Gifts of tongues, gift of prophecy. Lord, you still move and work in powerful ways. And you also move and work in intimate, quiet, peaceful ways. It is not our job to understand it. It is our job to worship you. It is our job to invite you in. So would you come and would you fill us again? We thank you for the move. We thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Lord, that this is not where it stops. but This is just where it begins. Because the reality is we can wake up tomorrow and be filled again to overflowing as we hunger and thirst after righteousness, as we hunger and thirst for your presence. In Jesus' name. You guys can stay up here and continue praying, but before we go, coming to the end of our service. I wanna to talk to anybody in the room here that maybe this is all new to you and you would, you're here and you would say like, I don't have a relationship with Jesus and I've just heard this message about the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit points back to Jesus but I actually need a relationship with the Lord first. I need a relationship with Jesus. I understand that, that I am broken and I need a savior, and I want to make that decision today. And so I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray because I believe there are people in here, and you need to either get right with the Lord. You've walked with Jesus at one point, but you've allowed your heart to grow cold. Or you're here for the first time. You're here, and you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time. And so I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. And if you can, if you're not praying and you want to repeat this with me, that would be amazing. But repeat this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross for me. And thank you for rising again for me. For overcoming the power of sin and death. So that I could be reconciled to God. Today I repent of my sin. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for salvation. I am now a Christian, a follower of God. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Amen. And if you made that decision, we would love to just give you a Bible. It's just a gift from us to you. And there's nothing special about this Bible other than maybe a memorial of the decision that you've made today. And I encourage you to take it. As we talked about, this is the truth. If you want to know who you are, 
You want to know your identity? You want to know what God says about you? It's all in here, and it's amazing. And so I would encourage you to take it and to read it and to find community, and you are welcome to come back here. We would love to have you as part of our church community, or if you're from somewhere far away, we can help get you connected to another local church. But it's been amazing having you here. And I would encourage you, church, don't, like I said before, don't leave this moment here. Let's be people that are hungry for the Holy Spirit in their lives. We can wake up every single day, put our hands to heaven, and ask God to fill us. Just, and it's as simple as that. Holy Spirit, would you fill me? Empower me for the day. And you know what? If there's no emotion or feelings, it's actually okay. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit hasn't moved. You know, in a marriage, I don't always feel like fuzzy feelings about my husband. Do you know that? Right? So why do we think that if we don't feel God, that he's not present? He's with us. And so he, like, it's, like it says in scripture, ask and you will receive. And so ask and then believe that you've received. It's that simple. And he will meet you every single day where you are. In Jesus' name, amen? All right. Thanks, church, so much. Love you. What a great message. What a great message. I'm not sure about that last little bit. Uh, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. It's all good. Hey, listen, God's been doing amazing things, amen, in our midst. And uh, hey, this is not something that we just leave right here, but we walk in it, amen. Holy Spirit moved in the upper room, and then the church started. Everybody got on with the work, but yet we walk in His mercies every single day, amen. His mercies in you every day day. And so I pray that whatever God spoke to you today, whatever was, I guess, um, refreshed in you today, then walk forwards with that and uh, continue to build on His Word. Amen. The truth of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Is that good? Hey, listen, uh, I'd love to pray with you before we go, but just remember, make sure you put in your Easter uh, dates into the calendar, Friday and Sunday. Those services will be 10 and 12, and uh, of course, uh, 10 and 12 on the Sunday as well, so both Friday and the Sunday. What are those dates, by the way? They weren't on here. I think the 31st is the Sunday. Uh, yeah, the Sunday, which means that the 29th must be the Friday. See, I could do math. I could do math, eh? <laughs> right on the spot. Uh, listen, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for every single person in this room. Pray, Father, you bless each one, Lord Jesus. You give them joy, peace, wisdom, strength, clarity. We just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for the service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, also remember your love, thy neighbor bags. Bring those to church as well. God bless. We love you.